quali sono i Presidenti della Repubblica dalla sua fondazione ai giorni nostri. De Nicola. De Nicola. Nicola. Burnic, Facchetti, Bedin, Guarneri, Picchi, Jair, Mazzola, Cappellini, Suarez, Corto. Sì, sì. It's somewhat appropriate that a man nicknamed the Wizard came into the world in mysterious circumstances. Helenio Herrera was born to an exiled Spanish anarchist in Argentina. When exactly isn't clear. His passport states that he was born in 1916, whereas his birth certificate says it was 1910. His wife claimed Herrera had changed the zero to a six to give himself six extra years of life, while there were also suggestions that his father falsified the date to avoid a fine for the late registration of his son's birth. His mother and father working as a cleaner and carpenter respectively, the ever-humble Herrera likening his father to Jesus Christ, struggled to make ends meet in Buenos Aires, and perhaps pushed by authorities, moved again, this time to Casablanca in Morocco. It was in Morocco that Herrera became a footballer, playing for hours on the beach as a child before joining Roche Noir as a teenager, then signing for Racing Casablanca. A solid defender, Herrera did enough to gain the attention of French clubs, moving to Paris. It was as a player in France that Herrera claims to have invented the sweeper role. It was, oh, about 1945, Herrera recalled. With 15 minutes to go, we were winning 1-0. I was the left back, so I tapped the left half on my shoulder and said, you take my place, and I'll go here beyond the defence. Already when I was a player, I fought like that, and we won, and when I became manager, I remembered that. If he was really telling the truth, then it took him a long time to remember it. Herrera started his managerial career in France, but then moved on to Spain, the homeland of his parents, winning the league twice with Atletico Madrid before eventually making his way to Barcelona, where he again won the league twice along with two Intercities Fairs Cups and a Copa del Rey. For a man who would become demonised for his defensive football, his spell in Spain showed little indication of what was to come. His Atletico Madrid and Sevilla sides averaged over two goals a match, and at Barcelona they averaged over three. Despite his success, Herrera was forced into leaving Barcelona after falling out with Laszlo Kubala and losing a European Cup semi-final to Real Madrid 6-2 on aggregate. Herrera moved on to Italy, taking over at Inter Milan. He brought with him his 4-2-4 shape from Barcelona, but soon adjusted to incorporate a sweeper. Inter had started the 1960-61 season with four wins, only to then draw against Lazio and Lecco. In their next game, Inter went a goal up early on against Padova, but then succumbed to a 2-1 defeat, and Herrera was crucified by the media. Their next game was the derby against AC Milan, and once Armando Picchi opened the scoring just before half-time, Herrera ordered Costanzo Balieri to retreat back behind the defensive line in order to avoid a repeat of the Padova fiasco. That was Herrera's story, at least. Sandro Mazzola claims it was actually Picky who told Balieri to move, and Herrera simply adopted the system from then on, not wanting to change a winning formula. Herrera understood that in Italy it was necessary to play like this, he said. Herrera failed to win anything in his first two seasons, though, and Inter's owner, all tycoon Angelo Moratti, who had already gone through 11 managers in the five years prior to Herrera's arrival, was growing impatient. He invited Edmondo Fabri to take over at Inter before having a change of heart giving Herrera one more season to save his job, and so the coach went all in on Catenaccio. The Italian word for door bolt, Catenaccio was comprised of a strict man-marking system in the defensive line, bolstered by a sweeper, providing cover behind them. Mario Vellini at Triestina, Ottavio Barbieri at Spezia, and Giuseppe Viani at Salernitania all had claims to have invented Catenaccio, yet it was Nereo Rocco who made it successful. Rocco took his hometown club Triestina from bottom place to the highest ever finish of second in Serie A before taking Padova from Serie B to third in Serie A. The success drew the attention of AC Milan, where Rocco would win two Scudetti and two European Cups. Rocco's first league title came just as Herrera was getting his final warning at Inter, so if there was anyone the Inter manager was going to copy, it was Rocco. Needing results, Herrera made his team more defensive, drawing the R of those he conquered, but ushering in an unmatched period of success for Inter, who won Serie A the following season, then the European Cup the next, then the Intercontinental Cup, and followed it up by winning the treble in 1965, making them the reigning Italian, European and world champions, adding yet another Scudetto the following year. Herrera may not have invented Catenaccio, but he became its greatest proponent, making himself a celebrity in an era where players gained all the attention. When I started, managers carried the team's bags, Herrera said. I put them in the place that they deserve to be, earning what they should earn. 
Inter's success was of course built upon a solid defence. In goal was Giuliano Sarti. The keeper is often forgotten when talking about the side, but was a very good player in his own right. He was a proto-sweeper keeper, rushing out to pick up the ball in behind his defenders and showing excellent concentration to ensure he was always on hand to support his defenders, even if it was just to give them a short passing option. He was also a very good shot stopper, albeit with a tendency to occasionally spill the ball. This wasn't unusual for the time, as goalkeeper clubs were only starting to get popularised in this period, but it did result in Inter conceding some important goals. Ahead of him at centre-back was Aristide Guarneri. An elegant stopper, it was rare for Guarneri to go to ground or even commit his body weight to a challenge, preferring to stand upright. By not overcommitting, he could quickly turn or recover when an opponent tried to beat him, other than throwing himself into a challenge, missing, and getting caught out of position. Instead, Guarneri would typically get tight to his man and deny them the space to operate, and step in when they took a poor touch or attempted to move past him. He would essentially wait for the opponent to bring the ball to him, after giving them so little space that any miscontrol would hand it over to him. Alongside him was Tarcisio Bernic. Although technically a fullback, Bernic's role was the same as Guarneri's, acting as a stopper closely marking the opposition winger. Bernic would often get pulled inside into central areas anyway, as Italian left wingers were generally more attacking than those on the right and would cut inside to shoot at goal. Nicknamed the Rock, Bernic was more aggressive than his defensive partner. He would stick incredibly tight to his man, breathing down their neck, and was much more willing than Guarneri to step in and intercept the ball or make a tackle ready to pounce on any mistake by the opposition, making him hard to beat in one-on-ones. At left-back was Giacinto Facchetti. He had played as a forward for his hometown team, but Herrera converted him into a full-back at Inter. He was a little weak in the defensive phase, recalled Mario Corso. He suffered a bit up against wingers and their dribbles, but thanks to his height he was very effective at defending in the air against balls coming into the box. Facchetti's size may have made him strong in the air, but it also meant he was slow to turn allowing tricky wingers to send it one way, then go the other before he could recover. Although Facchetti struggled more, both Guarnieri and Bernic were excellent man-markers, getting the balance right between staying close to their men to deny them space, but not so close a quick burst would see them get ahead of them. A common technique to try and rid themselves of their man-markers was for a player to come short, dragging an inter-defender upfield, then bursting into the open space behind them. Bernic and Guarnieri were good at recognising when this was coming and dropping off, but if the opposition was simply too quick for them, there wasn't much they could do. In the event that an opponent did escape their marker though, Armando Piki would be on hand to cover. Playing as a sweeper, Piki would position himself behind the defensive line, ensuring he was first to any balls and behind the opposition tried to play. Inter made no attempts to play an offside trap, instead opting to have Piki so deep he had the time to come across and meet an attacker before they reached the goal. So deep that if there was a bit of fog and you thought you'd gone past all of them, another one would appear, recalled Alfredo Di Stefano nullified in the 1964 European Cup final. Where did that bloke come from? Are they playing with 12 or what? The captain, Piki was the team's coach from the pitch, according to Corso. Guarneri and me, we played on the back of our direct opponent, remember Bernic. We had to follow him everywhere, but Piki was behind us and his job was to make up for our errors. If we let a player slip away, he was there to take care of him. He talked a lot on the pitch. He had a real personality and this ability to make you want to go into battle. I remember Herrera's speech as well. You. You're a defender. Your objective is to not let the opponent score. No errors. Picky was the defender of the defenders. Ahead of the defence was Carlo Tanyin. The midfielder was horrendous in possession, commonly misplacing any pass over a couple of yards away. But he was a disciplined defender, marking his opponent tightly so they couldn't escape him. If each week I had to play against Tanyin, I would abandon football, said Monaco's Yvonne Dewey. Tanyin left Inter in 1965 and was replaced by Gio Franco Bedin. Bedin was far superior to Tanyan in possession, able to play out under pressure or join the attack, but his role was still primarily a defensive one. He was a more aggressive defender than Tanyan, more willing to attempt to tackle. Alongside him was Luis Suarez. The Spaniard followed Herrera from Barcelona to Milan for a world record fee a year after the coach joined. Suarez was an inside forward that had won the Ballon d'Or while at Barcelona, yet Herrera converted him into a deep-lying midfielder. Despite being primarily a creative player, Suarez was a good defender in his own right, diligent in his duties, although he was obviously given more freedom than the likes of Tanyan or Bedin. To his left was Mario Corso. Herrera apparently detested Corso and would try to sell him every season, only for Moratti to veto his plans. It was clear to see why. Corso, his socks rolled down in the homage to Omar Sivori, didn't really like to run, regularly allowing opponents to simply waltz past him as he walked back. Despite nominally being a winger, Corso would rarely stay wide and hug the touchline though. 
preferring instead to come inside into the midfield and often drop in quite deep. Although one common joke was that he would simply position himself wherever there was shade. This meant that despite his laziness, Corso helped to block up the centre and deny the opposition space, fulfilling some kind of defensive purpose, even if he wasn't one to run or get stuck in. On the right, Jair da Costa would also track back deep into his own half, while even Sandro Mazzola would drop back and put in a defensive shift, especially after Inter took the lead. Inter's defensiveness meant they in many ways resembled a more modern side. Everyone always talks about Catanaccio referring to our game in the 1960s, said Bernic in 2014, but they all do it today, defending with 10 men in 30 metres as soon as there's a good team in front of them. The play is often very closed up, more so than in my time. In an era when most teams would leave their attackers upfield, leaving the team stretched across the pitch, Inter would pull their men back deep into their own half, playing more compactly and ensure there was less space for the opposition to exploit, particularly in defence, where a crowd of players would block the path to goal. My Inter had something that no other team had, said Metzola. We were as solid as we were technical. Once they regained the ball, Inter would look to play directly. In attack, all the players know what are wanted, said Herrera. Vertical football at great speed with no more than three passes to get to the opponent's box. If you lose the ball playing vertically, it's not a problem, but lose it laterally and you pay with a goal. A lot of the time, this simply meant pumping it long to the forwards. Given Inter would draw most of their players back, this generally left them understaffed in attack, and so the attackers would be left chasing after percentage balls, usually outnumbered by the defenders. Inter would occasionally benefit from this, the attackers pressuring the defenders as they controlled the aerial balls and pouncing on any errors but it generally wasn't a very successful strategy. Every now and again, there was a glimpse that Piki was capable of more, a nice pass or a good bit of control. However, most of the time, it would receive a ball, then pump it straight back upfield. Sweepers in Italy are called liberi, meaning the free ones. The free refers to their freedom from marking duties, but aside from that, the likes of Piki were some of the most restricted players on the pitch. Later on, friends back in Bauer, Gaetano Scaria and Franco Baresi would use the space they were afforded to stride forward on the ball and join the attack, but the likes of Piki weren't even allowed to push up past their defensive line, let alone leave their own half. Likewise, Guarneri would just play simple passes to a teammate, and although Bernic would sometimes push forward into attack, it was a rarity. We couldn't leave our role, said Bernic. I always say that the attacker is a fantasist for the defender must neutralise. At the time, defenders really had a secondary role. He moved only in function with his attacker. They, they did. And we, we stopped them from doing. The exception to this was, of course, Facchetti. With Facchetti, it's the wing or opposite who stuck marking him, joked Herrera. His long legs may have made it difficult for him to twist and turn with wingers, yet they also allowed him to burst forward out of defence, going from one end of the pitch to the other in 10 seconds. He had an exceptional physique that exuded power and the elegant stride of a 400-metre runner, remember Corso. He was incredible when he was flying towards the opposition goal. He lengthened his stride and became unplayable. He was an extra attacker. With Corso tucking inside, Fichetti had space to overlap into, and being right-footed despite playing on the left, he would often cut inside and shoot at goal. In the 65-66 season, Fichetti managed to get into double figures for goals scored. Jair provided a similar threat on the right. He would track back to help out defensively, but this deeper position also tied in well with his energetic style. If his marker followed him up the pitch, when he had the space to run into behind them, but if they decided to stay back in defence, then Jair had space to receive a ball and push forward into attack. The Brazilian relied more on athleticism than technical skill, looking to simply burst past the fullback and essentially covering the entirety of the right flank by himself. Jair and Fichetti overlapping was exactly the kind of high-speed football Herrera wanted, going from defence to attack in seconds, with their runs from deep areas making them difficult for the opposition to track. The wide men were typically supplied by Luis Suarez, having been moved back into a deep midfield role, the Spaniard could pick out beautiful passes into attack or out to the flanks to get into from defence into attack quickly. If a pass wasn't on though, he had the skill to dribble forward himself, either joining the attack or offloading the ball once a pass opened up for him. Corso could do the same alongside him, although he did also have a tendency to slow down Inter's play. It's easy to see why Herrera hated Corso, but it's also easy to see why Moratti insisted on keeping him. Even in the 60s, he seemed like a player from another era. Every time he got the ball, he seemed to do something amazing with it, earning the nickname God's Left Foot. Yet it would often take him five or six seconds before he actually released the ball. He might pick out a brilliant pass, but prior to doing so, he would give his opponents the time to retreat back into position. Corso also provided a significant set-piece threat using his falling leaf technique. It was similar to the knuckleball technique used today, but with less power. Using a short run-up, Corso would put the bare amount of power on the ball to get it over the wall, 
seeing it quickly drop low on the other side so that the goalkeeper struggled to reach it. Like Suarez, Corso possessed the skill to dribble forward on the ball, progressing into attack and taking opponents out of the game. Compared to the intensity of some of his teammates, Corso may have often looked like a dad playing in the garden with his kids, but his laziness was exaggerated. The player stating, you don't stay at Inter for so many years if you don't run. Ahead of them was Sandro Mazzola, the son of Torino legend Valentino. Mazzola was incredibly talented, full of little tricks and flicks, capable of dribbling past players and even having the touch to make something out of those long balls forward. Herrera prescribed dribbling and aimed to go from back to front in no more than three passes, but this often wasn't practical due to the way Inter's players retreated into their own half defensively. They needed time to get up the other end of the pitch. Inter often looked at their best when the likes of Suarez, Corso and Mazzola linked up, using their technical ability to work the ball forward exchanging passes. Their neat little one-touch passes might have made them more likely to lose the ball, but they also tended to create better chances than a nameless lamp forward. Mazzola was also Inter's primary goal scorer. He was usually partnered by another striker, but none of them were particularly notable. First there was Benny Amino di Chiacomo, then there was Aurelio Milani, then finally Renato Capellini. Their role was to leave the line and act as a foil to Mazzola, often pulling wide or chasing after long balls. Only Di Giacomo in 62-63 managed more than 10 goals in a season though. The most talented alternative was Joaquin Pero. The Spaniard rarely got to play though, as Serie A only allowed teams to field two foreign players at a time. Seeing as Inter already had Suarez and Jair, Pero was the odd man out and so only really appeared in Europe before leaving for Roma. Pero was most similar to Matt Zola, dropping off between the lines. However, he wasn't nearly as talented, often giving the ball away. Angelo Domenghini was a potential alternative to Jair on the right and played a similar game, all direct energetic attacking. And so including him in place of Jair opened up a spot for one of the other foreigners to play. Herrera's success wasn't just in putting quality players together though. He ensured they became great players by putting in work on the training ground. Herrera brought to Inter a lot of training sessions with the ball. Less weights and running, recalled Mazzola. His sessions were all based on speed. He said all the time that it was the most important thing, to be quick. If we aren't quick, we won't win. The wizard changed everything, claimed Bernic. When I played for Juventus, we did four laps of the pitch, then some passing exercises, and finally games. When I arrived at Inter, it was another world. With Ferreira, we never did a single training session without the ball. Individual technique, passing, tactical system, everything was trained at the same time. It was always a great intensity, said Suarez. It was completely different to all the others. The work was harder, stronger, quicker, more aggressive. A direct approach. He didn't laugh. He was very serious. In an era where many players still smoked and drank, Herrera paid close attention to diet, while he also introduced the concept of the retiro, where players would be taken away to a retreat, cut off from the world to focus on their game. Herrera apparently came up with the idea after reading a book about 16th century spiritual exercises and wanted to recreate the experience for his players. Staying at a hotel by Lake Como for home games, Inter would focus on preparation for the match and perhaps more importantly, couldn't get up to much else under the watchful eye of Herrera, ensuring strict discipline. I spent more time at the retreats with my teammates than at home, remembered Bernic. On Saturday, the Wizard gave us an analysis of the next day's opponent. So on Sunday, we all knew exactly what we had to do to win. On the pitch, Picky spoke as the captain, but Herrera had already said it all. To be honest, I think that even today, some coaches are less advanced than him. I've been accused of being tyrannical and completely ruthless with my players, Herrera said. But I merely implemented things that were later copied by every single club. Hard work, perfectionism, physical training diets and three days of concentration before every game. Herrera didn't just focus on his players' bodies, but also on their minds. He would hang up slogans such as, he who does not give his all gives nothing, and think with speed, act with speed, play with speed on the walls around the training ground, and demand his players hug and touch a football before matches, repeating, I must have it, I must have it. These courtish methods were ridiculed and even declared Mussolini-like by one journalist, but Corso says that the players began to buy into them once they began to have success. Herrera's wizard nickname wasn't always meant as a compliment though. It also implied something more sinister, a dark magic. This was a man who had recovered from diphtheria as a child and gone on to become a footballer and survived car and plane crashes. Had avoided the bombing of Lorient where he was due to sign a contract during the Second World War based only on a premonition the day before. There was just something a little off about him. Right from the start of his managerial career in France, there were reports that Herrera was doping his players, or he became known as the Pharmacy Cup coach to certain journalists at Barcelona. The rumours followed him to Inter. Herrera provided pills that were to be placed under our tongues, claimed Ferruccio Mazzola. He used to experiment on us bench players only to later give them to the first team players. Some of us would eventually spit them out. 
It was my brother Sandro that suggested to me that if I had no intention of taking them, to just run to the toilet and spit them out. Eventually, Herrera found out and decided to dilute them in coffee. From that day on, Il Café Herrera became a habit at Inter. I don't know for sure what was in the pills, but I believe amphetamines. Once after a Café Herrera, I suffered three days and nights in a state of complete hallucinations, just like an epileptic. That a number of Herrera's players would die young in mysterious circumstances would appear to support this theory, but many others deny it, with Ferrico's claims leading to a fallout between the Mazzola brothers, with Sandro claiming his little brother was simply out for revenge. Herrera's daughter Luna said her father only believed in psychological doping and that the pills diluted in coffee were just aspirin. Claims of doping were also used in Inter's favour. During the 1963-64 season, five Bologna players tested positive for performing enhancing drugs and were immediately suspended. The club docked three points. If there were suspicions of foul play though, the players' urine samples weren't adequately sealed, meaning they could have been tampered with, while the levels of methamphetamine the samples contained were enough to kill a man. Well-sealed samples of other players were found to contain no traces of drugs. The three dock points were returned to Bologna, Sigmund finished level one points with Inter, necessitating a playoff to decide the title for the first and only time in Serie A history. Bologna won to claim the Scudetto, but it would have been Inter's were it not for a deeper investigation into the alleged tampering. Inter were also accused of match-fixing in Europe. The accusations came to light when Hungarian fixer Dejo Solti, employed by Juventus secretary Italo Alodi, was found to have offered a referee $5,000 in a car to ensure Juve progressed past Derby County in their 1973 European Cup semi-final. Alodi, and so by extension Salty, had previously worked for Inter. Hungarian referee Georgi Vardas claimed he was offered enough money to buy five, six Mercedes to rig Inter's passage past Real Madrid to the 1966 European Cup final. But Vardas turned them down and Madrid progressed. Angelo Moratti complained bitterly about Vardas' refereeing, and the Hungarian would mysteriously never officiate any games at that level again. Two years prior, Inter had progressed past Borussia Dortmund in the semi-finals, helped by an early injury to a Dortmund player that went unpunished. A Yugoslav tourist claimed to meet the referee on holiday that summer, who told him that it was paid for by Inter. Inter then progressed again to the final the following year thanks to some questionable decisions by referee Jose Maria Ortiz de Mendebal in the semi-final against Liverpool. Italian teams just happened to have a spotless record whenever Ortiz took charge of their games. The accusations were never proven, but then they were never really looked into either, the authorities preferring to brush them under the carpet. Salty wouldn't admit to rigging matches, however he did admit to gifting gold watches to referees. Football is a game of fine margins, he said. All we did was try to ensure those were not against Inter. If a free kick is going to be given one way or the other, we wanted to make sure we were seen as the victim, not the opposition. Regardless of whether or not Inter's success had been bought and paid for, it wouldn't last forever. Domestically, more and more teams were looking at Inter as Herrera had at Rocco's Milan, seeing the template they needed to follow if they were to have success of their own. Juventus took this literally, employing a senior H. Herrera as coach, although it was Heriberto rather than Helenio. Bologna won the league in 1964, and Juventus won the Coppa Italia the following year with Francesco Janic and Ernesto Castano at sweeper respectively. Into a now trying to play counter-attacking football against teams that mainly defended as they did. Herrera was loathed abroad for his defensive football, but he and his players insist the criticism was unfair. We played six matches using Catanaccio and 40 matches with offensive football, said Mazzola. It's true we sometimes employed a very defensive system away from home, but we regularly played in a 4-2-4, and everyone worked very hard. It's difficult to tell exactly how true this is, because the only footage that exists of Inter from this era are the big games where they would play more defensively. However, while the team structure was undoubtedly defensive, the personnel could be quite attacking. He played for at left-back, had converted inside forward Suarez into a deep midfielder and included the technical skills of Mazzola and Corso, albeit the latter typically against Herrera's will. The problem is that most of the ones who copied me copied me wrongly, said Herrera. They forgot to include the attacking principles that my Catanaccio included. Inter never got close to the three goals a game of Herrera's Barcelona, but they did manage at least two a game in 60-61, 64-65 and 65-66. Bologna, on the other hand, would manage just 54 goals as they won the league in 1964, while Juventus scored a measly 44 in 1967. Inter were now being beaten at their own game. Inter had defensive problems as well as attacking ones, though. They lost the 1965 Coppa Italia final in large part because Cinezinho was running the game for Juventus in midfield, while they would be knocked out of the European Cup by a Real Madrid side playing a 4-3-3. Inter may have locked up their defensive third, but the opposition was able to find space in midfield to exploit. I asked him, 
But when an opposition attacker passes the midfield and isn't being marked anymore, why can't I push up on him and ask the sweeper to take my player, remembered Bernic? It was categorically no from him. Take care of your man and basta. Things reached ahead when Inter faced Celtic in the 1967 European Cup final. They had already thrown away the league, failing to win any of their final six games to see Juventus leapfrog them by a single point. Now it was time for Veritero again as they prepared for the final. I'm not joking. From the minute our bus drove through the gates of the hotel to the moment we left for the stadium three days later, we did not see a single human being apart from the coaches and the hotel staff recall Bernic. A normal person would have gone crazy in those circumstances. After many years, we were somewhat used to it, but by that stage, even we had reached our breaking point. We felt the weight of the world on our shoulders and there was no outlet. None of us could sleep. I was lucky if I got three hours a night. All we did was obsess over the match and the Celtic players. Fichetti and I, late at night, would stay up and listen to our skipper, Armando Piki, vomiting from the tension in the next room. In fact, four guys threw up the morning of the game and another four in the dressing room before going out on the pitch. Things wouldn't get better for Inter once the game started. They would take an early lead for a penalty. The Celtic were relentless as they saw a comeback. The Scots would manage 45 shots to Inter's three. Inter were only able to stay in it thanks to the saves of Sarti. I remember at one point, Piki turned to the goalkeeper and said, Giuliano, let it go, just let it go, it's pointless. Sooner or later they'll get the winner, said Bernic. I never thought I would hear those words. I never imagined my captain would tell our keeper to throw him a towel. But that only shows how destroyed we were at that point. Celtic had completely exposed the limitations of Inter's defensive approach. First of all, there was the constant movement. Celtic's attackers were constantly interchanged opening up spaces for their teammates to attack and dragging their markers away from their usual positions. Inter's defenders would track their men, but Celtic's movement made that much more difficult than usual. Against more static opponents, the Inter markers could keep an eye on their men while also keeping an eye on the gate around them, but here they were constantly on the move chasing after Celtic's attackers. How could they possibly be expected to see what was going on around them when their marking was taking up so much of their focus? It was Picky's job to cover for the markers and plug these gaps, but how was he supposed to when there were so many of them and where they were opening up was constantly changing? He was just one man. He couldn't be expected to cover for all four in front of him at the same time. At least the attackers had markers limiting their space though. Arguably the greater problem for Inter was that Celtic's midfielders, fullbacks and even centre-backs were all pushing forward into attack. The movement of Celtic's attackers would open up space and then the deeper players would attack it, left free by Inter. Celtic's equalising goal saw right-back Jim Craig pick up the ball in attack and square the ball to left-back Tommy Gemmell in space to shoot on the edge of the area, the two full-backs combining in attack. Their winner saw Gemmell overlapping space down the left, then cut the ball back to Bobby Murdoch in space in midfield to shoot, with Stevie Chalmers getting a touch to tap it in. It was a serious flaw in man-marking. If every defender was going to focus only on one man, then who was going to pick up these runs from deep? Are the attackers meant to follow them into defence? In which case, how are they meant to score any goals if they have all been dragged down the opposite end of the pitch? The irony of this was that Inter's attacking success had largely been based on exactly this. Fichetti and Jair making hard to track runs from deep, catching out opposition defences, and so Inter should have had a greater appreciation of its dangers. With total football just around the corner, this problem wasn't about to go away and man-marking would fall out of fashion at the highest level, but Herrera would insist that it was the proper way to defend until he died. Herrera would instead blame his defenders for the loss to Celtic, and shipped out Piki, Guarnieri and Jair at the end of the season. When things go right, Piki said, it's because of Herrera's brilliant planning. When things go wrong, it's always the players to blame. The next season, Inter would finish fifth, and Herrera packed his bags and left for Roma, never to reach the same heights again. If you enjoyed this video, please like and subscribe to support the channel. You can get updates on what I'm doing by following on Twitter and Facebook, links are in the description but most importantly by supporting Holding Midfield on Patreon. Without financial support, I can't justify the time it goes into making these videos to keep the channel alive while also receiving access to premium content. Thanks for watching.